My husband's affair with a med student shattered my trust. Now I'm rebuilding my life and embracing a future filled with strength and hope. My name is Emily, and from the outside, our lives probably looked like a neatly laid out sequence of ideal milestones. But sometimes, what you see on the surface doesn't quite tell the whole story underneath. My husband, Michael, and I met during our sophomore year at the University of Michigan. We were both pursuing degrees that promised intense careers, mine in architectural design and his in medicine. Our paths crossed in an elective class, History of Modern Europe, a subject far removed from our major fields, perhaps explaining why we noticed each other among the crowd of future doctors and architects. Our meeting was as mundane as it was fateful. A spilled coffee, a stack of medical textbooks teetering precariously, I reached out to help, and our stories entwined from that moment. He apologized for the mess, his voice calm, a stark contrast to the frantic rush of the cafeteria. We talked briefly about our courses, laughed at the serendipity of our majors colliding, and exchanged numbers. That brief encounter grew into long nights spent discussing everything from Renaissance literature to the intricacies of human anatomy. In him, I found a listening ear and a thoughtful heart. In me, he found a burst of creativity and warmth. From the start, Michael was the kind of man who drew people in effortlessly. His charisma wasn't the flashy kind that fades after a few encounters. It was a gentle, enduring magnetism, coupled with a brilliant mind that fascinated me, endlessly. I remember how during our study sessions, He'd relate historical events to human behaviors with such passion that even the driest facts seemed to breathe and live. We fell in love among books and coffee spills, our conversations stretching late into the night, often closing the library down. By the time we graduated, there was no question that we would marry. We were married two years after my graduation in a small, intimate ceremony surrounded by family and friends. It was simple, beautiful, just like we wanted. Our lives together felt like a constant adventure, from our small apartment filled with mismatched furniture to our discussions about future dreams and aspirations. Fast forward eight years, we were celebrating our daughter, Sophie's birthday. Born in the early uncertain days of 2020, she was a light in a time of global upheaval. Michael had by then become a respected professor at a medical school, adored by his students for the same reasons he had once captivated me. His career had flourished in the ways we had imagined, and he carried his responsibilities with an admirable balance of seriousness and empathy. Michael's career as a professor at the local med school was a source of pride for us both. He loved teaching, loved the spark in his students' eyes when complex concepts finally made sense. I watched him over the years, growing into a role that seemed tailor-made for him, mentor, educator, and occasionally friend to his students. He was a doctor himself, a fact that filled our conversations with fascinating, if sometimes gruesome, stories from the hospital. His dedication was as clear as the exhaustion that would sometimes shadow his features after a long day. For my part, I had put a pause on my own career to focus on raising Sophie, a decision that felt right despite the shadow it cast on my professional ambitions. It was a life that I never really questioned. The normalcy of it was comforting in its own way. My days revolved around playdates and parent-teacher meetings, interspersed with freelance design projects when time allowed. Michael and I, we were a team, or so I believed, navigating the challenges of parenthood and professional life with a kind of synchronized rhythm that most of our friends envied. Sarah, a fellow academic in Michael's department, had become one of my closest friends through these years. Our friendship was one of those fortunate relationships that extended beyond mere convenience and entered the realm of genuine affection and respect. Sarah had been there through every major milestone, my pregnancy, Sophie's birth, and every minor crisis in between. She was vibrant, outspoken, and fiercely intelligent. Our friendship had started on mutual professional respect and a shared love of old jazz music. She knew Michael as well as anyone could in the professional maze of academia. Their friendship, rooted in years of collaboration, seemed just another part of normalcy of our lives. She was a constant in our lives, trusted implicitly by both Michael and me. Sarah had always been straightforward, which made her recent behavior all the more puzzling to me. In the weeks leading up to that unsettling lunch, I had begun to notice subtle changes in the way she spoke about Michael. It started with offhand comments that seemed to hover on the edge of caution, suggesting I keep a closer eye on him, not just as a husband but in his professional sphere. Each time such a suggestion surfaced, she would quickly steer the conversation towards less delicate topics, like department politics or upcoming college events. Just watch how he is, Sarah would murmur as we watched Michael interacting with colleagues at a faculty gathering. Then, seeing my furrowed brow, she'd laugh and wave off her previous comment. I mean, look at how he manages to charm everyone. You snagged quite the catch. It was disconcerting. This pattern of hinting at something amiss and then retreating into platitudes about Michael's charm and professional dedication. My trust in Michael was unwavering. He was not just my husband but also the father of my child, 
a man who had always upheld the highest standards of integrity and affection in our marriage. How could I suspect him of untoward behavior? Michael was deeply involved in his role as a professor. He had always taken his responsibilities seriously, providing guidance and support to his students while maintaining professional boundaries. His love for us was evident, his commitment unwavering. So, when Sarah insinuated there was something I should be wary of, it felt like a betrayal of the trust one had in him. Each time Sarah made these cryptic comments, I observed Michael more closely, looking for any sign that might justify her insinuations. Yet nothing seemed out of place. His interactions with colleagues and students were as they had always been, respectful and professional. At home, he was the attentive husband and loving father, often talking about his students with pride, but never crossing the line into inappropriate fondness or familiarity. But Sarah's behavior grew increasingly odd. At times, she appeared distracted, her gaze lingering on Michael a little too long during social events, her comments more pointed, tinged with an urgency I couldn't understand. Emily, you know people sometimes change, right? Situations at work can get complicated, she said one evening as we cleaned up after a dinner party. Her tone was serious, lacking its usual lightness. Sarah, are you okay? You've been a bit off lately, I replied, concerned for my friend who now seemed to carry a burden she was hesitant to share. She paused, a frown creasing her forehead. It's nothing really, just work stress, I suppose. But you know, it's always good to keep an eye out for everything. Her ambiguity frustrated me. What was she hinting at? If there was a genuine concern, why wouldn't she just say it outright? Sarah's behavior continued to gnaw at me, a constant reminder that something wasn't quite right. Yet, every time I looked at Michael, every time we shared a laugh or a quiet evening together, Sarah's insinuations seemed ridiculous, almost offensive. How could I doubt the man who had been by my side through every significant moment of our lives together? As the weeks passed, I tried to dismiss the unease that Sarah's words had instilled in me. I focused on our family, on the upcoming holidays, on the simple joys of our daily routine. Michael was as present and engaged as ever, his demeanor at home not reflecting any of the concerns Sarah had subtly tried to plant in my mind. Then came the lunch in December, a turning point that forced me to confront the nagging doubt Sarah's strange behavior had sown. We met at a small cafe, a neutral space away from the familiar settings of work or home. Sarah seemed particularly tense that day, her usual vibrant self shadowed by a seriousness that immediately put me on edge. We ordered our food, and for a few moments, we engaged in the usual pleasantries. But as the waiter walked away, Sarah's demeanor shifted. She looked around, ensuring no familiar faces were within earshot, and then turned to me with a solemnity that instantly chilled the air between us. Emily, I've been beating around the bush for too long, and I'm sorry for that. I need to tell you something important about Michael. She began, her voice low and steady. It's about him and a student. I felt a cold not form in my stomach. The vague hints, the changed behavior, all led to this moment. Despite my deepest fears, I had believed in my husband's fidelity, in the sanctity of our life together. Sarah's next words would challenge everything I thought I knew, forcing me to see beyond the facade of normalcy that I had clung to so desperately. What she disclosed next wasn't just a revelation. It was a shattering of the trust and reality I had built my life around. Then, out of the blue, she voiced a suspicion that had apparently been troubling her for some time. Something, she suggested, might be going on between Michael and a med student. Specifically, a bright young woman who was not just any student, but one who seemed to look at Michael not just as a mentor but perhaps something more. The idea seemed ludicrous. Michael had always maintained a professional distance that bordered on aloofness, his interactions with students uniformly marked by respect and propriety. I laughed it off at first. It seemed so out of character for the man I knew, the man I had spent nearly a decade of my life with, who had always seemed as devoted to me and our daughter as he was on the day we said our vows. But as Sarah described what she called yearning looks, exchanged in moments caught in the corners of classrooms and hallways, my laughter began to sound hollow, even to my own ears. What was I missing? Was the routine that I cherished merely a veneer, hiding a fissure I was too afraid to acknowledge? Despite my initial dismissal, Sarah's words planted a seed of doubt, one that, unbeknownst to me, was about to sprout into a confrontation that would challenge everything I thought I knew about our seemingly perfect life. Finally, she set down her fork, took a deep breath, and said, there's something I've been meaning to talk to you about, and I'm not really sure how to say it. Her voice was serious, and I felt a twinge of anxiety at the gravity of her tone. This was not our usual gossip or chatting about departmental politics. Something was off. Is everything okay? I asked, trying to mask my concern with a sip of my tea. It's about Michael, she began, and my heart skipped a beat. I've noticed something, off, at work. She paused, searching for the right words. It's about how he's been with one of the med students. I felt a defensive wall immediately go up. Michael had always been professional, a model professor, and the suggestion that there might be something inappropriate was jarring. Sarah, 
What are you talking about? My voice came out a bit sharper than I intended. She flinched slightly, which only made my stomach tighten more. I've seen them together, and it's just the way they look at each other. I've known Michael for years, right? He's never looked at anyone else like that. Not even close, she continued, her eyes now meeting mine with a mixture of concern and apology. Looks. Sarah, you're basing this on looks? I couldn't hide my incredulity. The idea seemed absurd, plucked from thin air or perhaps some daytime drama. It was unlike Sarah to make such vague accusations. Yes, I know it sounds crazy, she admitted, rubbing her temples. I wouldn't have said anything if it wasn't so obvious. It's like, like watching a slow burn romance movie. He looks at her the way he used to look at you. The word stung, more than I expected. A vivid image of James's tender gazes in our early days flashed through my mind. His eyes filled with unspoken words and promises. It was painful to think of those looks directed at someone else, let alone a student. I'm sure you're overthinking it, I said, forcing a laugh that sounded hollow even to my own ears. Michael is devoted to his work and to us, he wouldn't jeopardize that, it's probably just professional admiration or something. You know how passionate he is about mentoring. Sarah nodded, looking relieved that I wasn't upset but still unconvinced. Maybe. But just watch them, okay? I hope I'm wrong. I really do. The rest of our lunch passed in a blur. I kept replaying Sarah's words in my mind, each repetition chipping away at my initial disbelief. By the time we parted ways, a seed of doubt had been firmly planted, despite my efforts to dismiss it. That evening, as Michael came home and wrapped me in a warm, familiar embrace, I tried to see any hint of what Sarah had mentioned. He was the same as he had always been with me, caring, loving, asking about my day with genuine interest. But now, a filter of suspicion tinted my perception, coloring his every action, every smile. Later, as we settled down after dinner, I brought it up casually. Sarah and I had lunch today, I mentioned, watching his face for any sign of change. Oh, he responded, looking up from a book. How is she? Good, good. She mentioned something funny, though. I forced a chuckle, trying to keep the mood light. She thinks you have a crush on one of your students. He laughed, to dismiss it as ridiculous. Despite Michael's denials and his sudden criticism of Sarah, something inside me refused to settle. His words, intended to cast doubt on Sarah's integrity and divert attention from himself, only fueled my determination to unearth the truth. How could he suddenly turn on Sarah, a friend who had been nothing but supportive to us both? His accusations seemed like desperate attempts to protect himself, and the discrepancy between his words and his actions left a bitter taste in my mouth. On the surface, I maintained a composed facade. I laughed at the right moments, nodded along to his explanations, and pretended to consider his perspective. But beneath that calm exterior, my mind was racing, piecing together every odd remark, every late night at the office, every unexplained absence that had seemed insignificant at the time but now loomed large with suspicion. I knew I needed more than just my instincts and Michael's word against Sarah's. I needed concrete evidence, something undeniable. I began by checking our phone records, something I had never felt the need to do before in our marriage. It felt like a betrayal on my part, an invasion of the trust we had built over the years. But these were desperate times. The phone records showed nothing unusual at first glance, calls to colleagues, his secretary, his brother. But then I noticed a number that recurred more frequently than others at odd hours, sometimes late into the night. It was a number I didn't recognize. My heart sank as I scribbled it down, a sense of betrayal washing over me anew. Next I turned on our computer at home. Michael was meticulous about logging out of his accounts, but he'd become complacent, perhaps too confident in his ability to cover his tracks. I found his email open, a thread highlighted, and as I clicked on it, I braced myself for what I might find. The emails were careful guarded, but the underlying tone was unmistakable. They were more than professors and students exchanging academic pleasantries. There was a personal touch, a warmth that should not have been there. Armed with this information, I still felt hollow. Confirmation of Michael's deceit didn't bring the satisfaction I'd hoped for. It only amplified the pain. With every piece of evidence, our marriage felt more like a lie, and the man I thought I knew slipped further away. However, I decided not to face him. Over the next few days, my interactions with Michael remained superficially normal. We spoke about mundane things, Sophie's schedule, grocery lists, the trivialities of daily life that didn't touch the raw nerve of our fractured relationship. Inside, my world was in chaos, but I kept a calm exterior. He was none the wiser, believing perhaps that we were slowly bridging the gap between us, while in truth, I was meticulously planning my next steps and gathering more evidence. The weekend was approaching, and I had already laid my plans. The Nursing Mothers Association, a group I joined after Sophie's birth, had organized a camping trip. It was the perfect alibi to leave home for an extended period without arousing suspicion. I informed Michael only a couple of days beforehand, asserting that it would be a good bonding experience for Sophie and me, 
and a refreshing break for myself. He responded with enthusiasm, overly so, which now seemed another red flag in his recent behavior. Have a great time, he said smiling. You both deserve this break. Don't worry about anything here. His ready agreement to our absence gave me the window I needed. I'd arranged for a neighbor, ostensibly to check on our house in my absence, but in reality, to observe Michael's movements when he thought he was unwatched. This neighbor, Jenna, was a trusted friend who was aware of my situation and willing to help. The camping trip itself was a much-needed distraction. Being around other women, sharing stories and laughter, allowed me to breathe a little easier, even if just for a day. Sophie loved the outdoors, her laughter mingling with the breeze, her joy at the simple things, a butterfly, the crackle of a campfire, helping to lift the weight from my chest. Meanwhile, Jenna texted me updates. Michael had left the house mid-morning and didn't return until late in the afternoon. She couldn't see where he went but noted the time for later reference. When he returned, he brought someone with him. My heart sank reading her message. The visitor was female, young, and they seemed comfortable with each other. Too comfortable. Jenna couldn't get close enough to hear conversations without risking being seen but managed to snap a few photos from her upstairs window. Returning home late Sunday, I felt a mix of dread and anger. The atmosphere in the house was too calm, Michael too casual. He asked about the camping, his curiosity feigning innocence. I shared anecdotes of our outing, all the while feeling a nauseating mix of betrayal and resolve churning inside me. The next day after Michael left for work and Sophie was at her daycare, I met with Jenna to collect the photos. The images were grainy, but the intimacy was unmistakable. Their proximity, their body language, and the ease between them. It was more than enough to confirm my suspicions. Armed with this new evidence, I knew I had to confront Michael. But first I needed more concrete proof, something undeniable that would prevent him from weaving more lies. I contacted a private investigator, recommended by a lawyer friend. Discretion was key, and the investigator assured me he could discreetly track Michael's movements and interactions over the next few weeks. As the investigation unfolded, I maintained a veneer of normalcy at home. Michael seemed oblivious to the undercurrents, perhaps blinded by his own duplicity or convinced of his ability to conceal his affair. But the strain of living a double life, playing the part of the dutiful wife while secretly orchestrating an investigation into my husband's infidelity, was exhausting. Finally, the investigator provided me with a report. It included times, places, even audio recordings of conversations between Michael and the student. The evidence was damning, irrefutable. They spoke of their feelings for each other, their plans to keep their relationship secret until the timing was right, whatever that meant. With the proof in hand, I felt a cold resolve settle over me. This was not just a fleeting mistake on Michael's part, but a deliberate, ongoing betrayal. I decided it was time to confront him, not just as his wife, but as someone who deserved the truth. The confrontation was planned for an evening when Sophie was staying over at a friend's house. I didn't want her to witness the potential fallout. When Michael came home, I was sitting in the living room, the pile of evidence laid out on the coffee table in front of me. He sensed something was off the moment he walked in. His smile faltered as he saw the papers and photos spread out, his eyes widening as he took in their implications. Emily, what is this? His voice was shaky, the usual confidence gone. It's over, Michael, I said quietly, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside me. I know everything. There's no point in denying it any longer. He sank into a chair, burying his face in his hands. The next few hours were a blur of accusations, tears, and confessions. Michael pleaded for forgiveness, promising to end the affair and do whatever it took to repair our marriage. But something inside me had broken beyond repair. The trust was shattered, and no amount of remorse could rebuild it. I asked him to leave, to give me space to think about the future. He left, defeated, carrying a small suitcase with his belongings. The house felt empty, the silence a stark contrast to the chaos of emotions that had filled it just hours before. In the days that followed, I consulted with my lawyer to discuss the next steps. Divorce seemed the inevitable conclusion, not out of spite but necessity. I needed to rebuild, to create a stable, honest life for Sophie and myself. As I navigated the complexities of separation and legal proceedings, I also reached out to a therapist to begin working through the emotional fallout of the betrayal. It was a long road ahead, but for the first time in months, I felt a sense of agency over my own life. Looking back, I couldn't help but feel a profound sense of loss. For the marriage I thought I had, for the partner I believed Michael to be. But there was also a growing sense of resilience, a knowledge that I could face whatever came next. For Sophie, for myself, I would build a new life, one rooted in honesty and strength. The journey was just beginning, but I was ready to face it head on.